Now we're going to play a selection from the AIM archive. So we have a situation where there's a, a group of people, the original inhabitants of this continent, are also the most impoverished inhabitants of the continent. And yet they own great wealth, mineral wealth, land wealth, legally under the treaties. But as you described with the trust fund, uh, in, by a variety of means, including outright theft, this is this money, this resources has not been available to them. So is the native the total native population in the United States about a million and a half or a little more than that? Is that about right? I believe at one time we were decimated at the turn of the century down to less than three hundred thousand. Uh, we've come back on conservative estimates we're now about three point eight million people. Uh, representing all of the different indigenous nations and distinct groups okay. in what is called the United States. But uh, okay, so probably, then, uh, you know, our people don't um, respond to census takers. <laughs> to them, they're just another process server or bill collector or, or somebody that's intruding into our community. So. A lot of times our people aren't counted, but uh, conservative estimates, and I think fair estimate would be about maybe 3 to 3.8 million, which okay. is a sizable population. All right, so the question then is, in terms of what is, what are the important aspects of the situation that those people face and contend with? Well, first of all, you know, our, as I indicated in the previous program, 137 billion and counting have disappeared from U.S. Treasury accounts, which is money that's supposedly held on behalf of individual Indian people who incidentally have been locked into decades, generational poverty because of the fact that the United States seemingly have squandered all the money that supposedly paid for the resources that are being exploited anyhow. So, you know, we're taking a, a, another devastating hit here unless the government uh, comes up with this money, and they should come up with the money, and they will come up with the money. Uh, if they don't, we may have to start taking our oil fields back, our natural gas fields, our uh, iron ore mines. We may have to start foreclosing on a deadbeat society called America. Um, so. The reality is, in many of the remote areas, our people are quite limited on the form of economic development that they can uh, embark on. Um, in near large metropolitan areas, of course, about a handful of our tribes, our nations, have done quite well. I mean quite well. And, uh, and in the more remote remote rural areas, of course, our people have to depend on uh, winter tourism or summer tourism, and which is somewhat limited. <clears throat> so they're not doing as well. They're not reaping the big revenues that uh, those casino resorts that are near urban metropolitan areas are, are reaping. So being somewhat limited to the type of uh, economic development, um, it's still very difficult for most of our people. Um, many people do not benefit uh, at all by the resort casino industry, as, as is the case, as I described, near large metropolitan areas. But in spite of that, uh, the revenues that they are generating, for the most part, are going for hospitals, clinics, which the U.S. government was supposed to provide it under the treaties, schools, uh, infrastructure, uh, housing for the elders, scholarship money for our students. Uh, so many of the uh, leadership of different uh, uh, distinct Indian nations uh, are doing quite well with the revenues that they're deriving from the casino resort industry, uh, benefiting their people. But then again, uh, as I said before, many of our people are locked out of those large profits because of their they're in the remote areas, in the rural areas. So 
uh, they have to be very creative on what they can do to resolve the problems uh, of poverty. In terms of the, the effects of the casinos, um, am, I, I'm right in, am I right in assuming that, for one thing, it's just sort of been random as far as who's gotten a casino. In some cases, tribes with very small memberships have gotten casinos. In other cases, larger uh, groups of people have gotten them. In, in some cases, tribes have chosen just to make a per capita payment to every member. In other cases, they've taken the money in a community way. And, and can you talk, about, I, I guess, about that and also about the issue of is it, has it created an additional problem of having people now wanting to control that money? Because obviously any time there's big money, it's attractive to uh, whether that's people within the Indian community or outside investors. I assume a lot of these casinos are in partnership with the various Las Vegas companies. Well, with, uh, you know, with economic power comes political power. Uh, that's a dynamic that plays a big role here. But in terms of... Uh, Outside interest. At first, of course, when uh, tribes first got the message that the American Indian Movement brought about in the early 70s, when we said aim for sovereignty, uh, most of our tribal governments, our Indian governments, uh, had become totally subservient to state, county, and the federal government and federal and state programs. So it was very hard for them to challenge these entities when they were getting much of their money, which incidentally is a treaty responsibility here. We're talking about a treaty responsibility. We're not on the welfare dole. America's on our welfare dole. America is the biggest welfare recipient in the world. Everything they got, they got stealing from indigenous people here. All of their wealth came from, derived from that. So I wanted to make that straight. Right off, right off. Um, um, but uh, at first, uh, when Indian nations started to exercise their sovereignty, which is a word we gave them, most of them didn't have no idea what the word meant until the American Indian movement said, aim for sovereignty, which essentially means our relationship through treaties is with the federal government, not state or county government that exempt us from zoning, taxation, uh, environmental protection, uh, all civil matters, uh, most of criminal matters except the Major Crimes Act, which the federal government has the um, jurisdiction. And where tribes uh, have found themselves under uh, state jurisdiction under Public Law 280, which I understand was passed in the early 50s, giving uh, concurrent criminal jurisdiction to the states where the Indian governments were not exercising their jurisdiction. Um, and being that the, the state has no standing other than what was granted under Public Law 280, which is concurrent criminal jurisdiction, uh, the tribes are exempt from state taxes, regulatory control, which then gave them the opportunity to open up large resort casino, high stakes bingo, high stakes gaming, uh, without the tribe having a standing. So then the Federal Congress passed what they call the American Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which is pretty stringent regulations, which makes it virtually impossible for organized crime to get a foothold in our uh, reservation casino resorts. Um, if, uh, if somebody's got money invested and nobody knows about it, then nobody knows about it. But for the most part, the uh, Indian Gaming uh, Commission, uh, which is an oversight body, is pretty stringent on on making sure that the, uh, there's no outside criminal interest coming into the casino resort business and that the tribes are using the money for its intended purpose, that is to benefit the uh, general welfare and needs of their tribal members. So uh, there is not a lot of, if any, organized crime in the Indian casino resort business. Would you say then that 
the casinos are are pretty much a that this is definitely a beneficial uh oh definitely element. when you're when you're limited by the because of uh, uh the remoteness of your community in one case uh very limited opportunities for uh, other forms of economic development certainly while casino resorts are not the best exercise of sovereign authority. That is, the tribes have a right to do this. Um, it'll do until something better comes around. And as I say that, uh, there are many different, uh, uh, different tribal governments, uh, Indian governments, uh, management of their resort casino industry uh, are diversifying. Uh, a lot of their investments, they're investing in different other areas. And I think that's really smart because, uh, you know, the Indian hasn't had anything yet of value that the white man didn't want, uh, particularly the greedy politician and business community. Uh, that has been our history, it's been our experience, and uh, we have to look at the future that that would become a reality again. Um, you see, with economic power comes political power, and with political power comes economic power. And there are a lot of factions in this country that don't want to see the Indian have any money in their pocket. They don't want to see us have economic clout or economic power because we start buying land, land that was stolen from us. We start buying land back. Somebody one time said, and we're always asked a question, what are you Indians doing with all that money? So they automatically see an Indian, they think, well, we must be having all this money. They don't realize what the message I've told you here and our, our viewers and listeners out there, that not all of our Indian communities are doing that well. But well, plus they, they don't ask that question of like no. the Republicans. What are you no. Republicans doing with all your money? money? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing what, with your money? What Rockefeller, yeah. what are you doing yeah. with all your money? <laughs> uh, well, uh, what I always say, of course, is that we're, you know, we're going to buy the country back. And then I'll add from the Germans and the Japanese. And uh, of course, you know, everybody knows that uh, Germany and Japan and Canada have made considerable investments in America. So they're really buying up America. And so we'll be buying it back, not necessarily from the Americans, because they'll have already sold it to the Germans or the Japanese. And, uh, and of course, a lot of my Japanese friends, when they hear me tell that story, they get quite a laugh out of that because they're faced with all the stereotypes also of rising up out of the ashes of the Second World War and, uh, and being able to now do to the United States economically what they couldn't do militarily. Uh, it's amazing. They won the war, really, in spite of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They really won the war economically. So um, we always use that as an example. But, you know, there are those uh, politicians and and uh, different people, they don't want to see the Indian have any money in their pocket. They like us better when we're broke and impoverished than when we have money and consequently economic and political power. Is it safe to say, I guess one of the things that I had heard someone mention at, at one of the events that we've recorded over the last few years was that, uh, well, first of all, I've gotten the impression that there are definitely interests at the federal level who would like to um, take away the casinos if they could figure out a way to do that. And I had heard some comments made about the risks of going to federal court in cases such as, say, the, um, the trust funds, because when you go into court and open up a series of issues, you don't really have control over where the judge may take that, and that it, it kind of opens up a, a window to... Um, to tamper with things that maybe the you didn't really want tampered with, but but is it safe to say that even just having the casinos is under under assault or under attack legislatively, politically, at whatever level? Oh, there are various state politicians, uh, even here in Minnesota. Um, give you an example: when the uh, visionary uh, tribal leadership uh, here in uh, in Minnesota, uh, got the message of the American Indian Movement when we said aim for sovereignty, and that they are exempt from state regulatory control, taxation, etc. Uh, they were those uh, um, 
different leaders that uh, took that message and began to put in, first of all, uh, tax-free cigarette shops. From there, uh, some of these visionary leaders had, uh, um, such as Dave Larson from what is now called the uh, Lower Sioux, I think they call them that, Morton, Minnesota, they got the Jackpot Junction Casino. And others uh, started to look at high stakes bingo, uh, you know, not under control of the state. State had no authority. Um, there were like the American Legion, the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Church, who taught me how to play bingo in the basement of the church, along with catechism, incidentally. Uh, um, uh, you know, they they started to cry because here these Indians were now taking all the bingo profits from their small state-controlled bingo operations. And of course, we remind them, as I just did, and I'll say it again, you know, uh, what could be wrong with bingo? We learned how to play it in the church, you know, how to be okay. But now that Indian started to utilize that to, to build economic power, to expand their land base, purchasing land that was stolen from them, incidentally. Um, there are always those factions that would like to shut them down. And from the high stakes bingo, of course, uh, uh, we've seen these leaders go into development of a casino uh, operations, casino resort. Some of them are really quite uh, elaborate, as, as you're well aware. Uh, and they're all doing quite well. Those, again, and I repeat, that are near large metropolitan uh, communities where they can get the a number of people out to patronize their their establishments. Um, <clears throat> you know the uh, yeah, there's always those people that want to take this away uh, in the states. To give you an example of Mystic Lake, I was talking about out here, outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, a place with the Midwakanton, Dakota. Uh, is what their name is, uh, called Shakopee. Uh, they're out in the Shakopee uh, community. Um, there's a Canterbury racetrack out there that's fallen on hard times down through the years, uh, have gone bankrupt, out of bankruptcy. Um, and they were almost near bankruptcy, and this Canterbury uh, racetrack is right near the Shakopee Midwakanton Dakota community, which has a, one of the finest resort casino operations called Mystic Lake. Um, they offered to buy Canterbury Racetrack and then put in a small casino. I mean, is it, wouldn't a casino be compatible with uh, a paramutual horse racing? I mean, it seems like it would go hand in hand. Uh, they wanted to uh, purchase Canterbury bail them out, so to speak, and then put in a, a small casino, expand their casino operation over there. Well, the politicians in the state of Minnesota, uh, good old white boys, all got together and they didn't want to see these Indians end up with this uh, horse race track, Canterbury. So they blocked that. Uh, several years after struggling, the owners of Canterbury went to the state legislature and persuaded them to let them put in a poker room. In other words, they are doing now what they didn't want the Shockey Midwakanton Dakota people to do. And now they're trying to get slots. And these same greedy politicians uh, are now talking about opening another state run casino in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. See? So it isn't that they really want to expand gaming. But they just don't want to see Indian people get all the revenues. They want it themselves. So, yes, we're always faced with that threat. And uh, no doubt into the future, we're always going to be faced with that threat. And, and does the state, as far as you know, do they get some kind of cut or whatever from the Indian casinos? And they have what they call under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that for the first time gave the states standing. Many of us, including a man that's passed on into the spirit world, uh, Roger Jourdain, one of the principal chiefs of the Red Lake Ojibwe up in northern Minnesota, 
and a man named Wendell Chino, who was the tribal leader for years of the Mescalero Apache, uh, they declared that American Indian Gaming Regulatory Act unconstitutional, but yet Congress passed it. And what it did is it gave the states a standing which they never had before. They had no standing whatsoever. It gave them standing that the governors can compact with the various Indian governments, Indian communities, can compact with them. Uh, and in that compact, they can derive a part of the revenues from the casino operation. Uh, here in the state of Minnesota, I think it was Governor Rudy Perpich. Uh, he made a compact with the tribes, which is supposedly into perpetuity, because we heard that before. Into perpetuity, and of course the politicians are still crying that Perpich, Governor Perpich gave everything away. Well, they didn't have anything to begin with. At least he got them something with the passage of the American Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And um, so now the states do have standing. And some states, like Wisconsin, the governor really held up the tribe, threatened not to compact with them, thus they would have to shut down their operation. So our tribes are always faced with that. So we would expect that the politicians in Minnesota are once again trying to find ways to trample on their own words uh, before the ink is even dry on the paper. In terms, I said about the treaties, in terms of the compacts, they're finding, they're trying to find ways to, uh, to wiggle out of this compact and this agreement that D Governor Perpich made which is binding on all future governors and governments in this state. But they'll find a way to break it. They'll pass a special law or something. I have no doubt. Right. They probably will find some way. Just as with mineral resources, um, it's almost as if to the perspective of the dominant culture, it's just unthinkable to, quote, give away all that wealth, even though it they're talking about, quote, giving it away to the people who own it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, give, giving away something that they stole to begin with. Right. Fact is, you know, uh, I always use this little uh, anecdote. Um, you know, in Hollywood, uh, they always come up with these flowery phrases that have nothing to do with our culture, our way of life. But in Hollywood, they always came up with the little anecdote or cliche that this will be yours as long as the grass is green, the rivers flow, and the sun shall shine. And, um, and of course, that's, none of those words are in the treaties. It sounds good. It doesn't mean nothing. But we think that uh, we have to paraphrase that because what they really mean was uh, as long as the rivers flow, the grass is green, the sun shall shine, or we found, find oil, whatever comes first. That's, that's kind of the way it is. So let's go to enrollment issues. And again, my, these questions are just coming from things I've heard or things that struck my attention. But um, it seems like in situations where, particularly in situations where there's big money or in situations where there's mineral or even waste dump issues, and there are outsiders who will fund one tribal government faction over another, like maybe what was happening with Dick Wilson in Pine Ridge, um, that there are issues around um, who gets to vote in the tribal elections. And so I've heard talk about uh, large numbers of people being adopted in to support one faction. I've heard about people who had political views that were in opposite of the ruling group being disenrolled. I guess what are the issues there? And is there a struggle for control of the tribal governments either around, around greed issues because of casino money or because of outsiders wanting to influence the disposition of the mineral resources? Sure. Well, there's several uh, <clears throat> aspects to that problem, uh, I'll try to cover them. Uh, first of all, uh, down through the years after the uh, reservation lands were established through treaties, um, there was always an effort by those to come in and encroach and squat, uh, squatters, uh, in our reservation lands. 
A lot of times, some of these people were successful in being able to do that uh, undetected, while eminent domain and adverse possession doesn't apply on, on a treaty lands. <clears throat> uh, there are people that came in and squatted on the land, and after so many years, uh, they were kind of accepted. And then the counties and the state start to tax that land, which is totally illegal. None of the land inside the reservations were ever to be taxed. That was one of the ways they stole uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of land uh, by imposing an illegal tax. And then when our people didn't have the wherewithal to pay the tax, they come in and took their allotments, took their land. So in most reservation communities, a lot of non-Indian people were able to encroach and, and uh, sort of incorporate themselves into the Indian community. Intermarriage, uh, blood quantums were cut time and time again until you have <coughs> people in our communities, because of this reality, are not genetically Indian. I mean, their, their blood has been so weakened through intermarriage that they're, they're no longer Indian. There may be <coughs> a 32nd, a 64th, an 8th degree Indian. So a lot of them were intermarried into families that are enrolled. So a lot of times our, our own people made a move to have their, uh, have their families uh, enrolled. And then finally, the, uh, because of the problem, some tribes, tribal governments, adopted a policy that you had to be one quarter degree Indian to be enrolled. Well, then they said, well, where are we going to cut this off? I think they picked the date of arbitrarily of 1952, as I recall, a certain date in 1952. In other words, any children born before that date, regardless of their blood quantum, could be enrolled. And there are sizable numbers of them, incidentally, because of the intermarriage. Um, if you were born after that date and were less than one quarter degree Indian blood, you couldn't get enrolled. Uh, and there are many families who have children that are enrolled and children that aren't enrolled. The children that are enrolled are entitled to scholarship funds, uh, scholarship monies, uh, um, health care, in many cases housing. But the child that's not enrolled is sort of alienated. Uh, they're not entitled to scholarship monies unless a tribe specifically appropriates money for that, and some tribes have done that, regardless of whether they're enrolled or not, have put money up to take care of them. But there's one case recently where there were two factions, and it said that the votes were so close because they were pretty much all family. There were two families. And if on election day two people woke up mad at one of the candidates, the regime changed just on that whim. Uh, and so one of the people got in under that type of uh, situation and then took and arbitrarily and unilaterally enrolled all of his relatives, many who are not even Indian. And now they're taking control of the, of the government and they're getting all the revenues while Indians that are full blood or at least a quarter degree that could get enrolled, they won't enroll. So they've been able to shut the door and just take care of their own. And I think that that is going to be one of the downfalls of gaming if that continues, or if the Indian Gaming Commission allows that to continue. But it, it's really a serious problem in many communities of identity. Uh, people feel alienated, uh, young people that can't get enrolled because they weren't born after a certain date or I should say in this case, weren't born before a certain day, which was again in 1951, I believe, or 52, they can get enrolled. So you have families where four or five children are enrolled or get the benefits, maybe two or three aren't enrolled because they were born after a certain date. It just doesn't seem fair, but how do you deal with it? I mean, we got to protect the uh, cultural integrity of our, of our nation. Uh, Otherwise, we're going to end up with uh, some communities of white people. It's no longer a reservation. It's no longer a nation. It's, uh, it's almost like committing cultural genocide to allow that to happen. 
But many tribes are wrestling with that problem and uh, uh, seeking some solutions. They're hard to find. Um, well, so this brings a couple of thoughts to mind. One is that um, this is partly an issue, the, the issue of wanting to be enrolled to get some kind of help because the the native nation is taking care of its people. If the dominant society also took care of its people, then you wouldn't have to be, try to exploit your 64th of Indian heritage to get a scholarship because you'd just be able to get a scholarship, which would just be kind of a sane thing. And, and sure. worth noting that a lot of these issues are driven by the fact that the society in general uh, exploits people in every direction. Um, well, there's no doubt uh, there are people that uh, have never been culturally, spiritually, socially, economically, or politically tied to an Indian nation, an Indian community. Um, very romantically and mystically want to identify with something other than they are for the reason that we've described earlier. I think uh, Caucasian Americans in particular suffer, and to repeat, probably a worse identity crisis than even some of our people. Uh, they no longer know who they are. They don't feel connected. Um, I think this is why a lot of, over a period of time, you see people in you know, uh, Hare Krishna, Zen Buddhism, uh, back in the, when the Black Panther Party was rising up and uh, the black movements, you had Caucasian Americans getting their hair dyed and having it curled up and putting on an Afro shirt and wanting to identify with the uh, black uh, panther movement or the black liberation movements. Went out and marched with Dr. King and Malcolm X, as many of us have. Um, and then, of course, when Cesar Chavez started to uh, uh, the great boycott and uh, farm workers started to march. A lot of these same people uh, took off their Afro shirt and let their hair grow and put it in a, in a bun in the back and, and put on a poncho and then they wanted to march with the, um, with the uh, great boycott, the farm workers. And then when the American Indian movement exploded on the scene, the same people come around, they were white folks, nice people. But all of a sudden, they start putting on jewelry and letting their hair grow and braiding their hair. And before long, they blink their eyes and they start giving themselves Indian names, almost like it's a game. And it's part of that identity crisis. They want to identify with something, and they're willing to perpetuate this fraud even on themselves, much less on us. So then when the, uh, uh, when the first casinos started to open here in Minnesota, case in point, a remnants of the Pequot nation who suffered the most terrible genocide at the hands of the colonists up in uh, what was called Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, at that time. Um, the Pequots were in their longhouse celebrating their green corn dance. This was in approximately 16, I think in the 1630s as I recall celebrating their green corn dance, which was their Thanksgiving that they celebrated every, every year since time immemorial. Uh, they were a fishing society, agricultural society. Uh, they had the finest villages, communities, churches, tabernacles. Their longhouse was their church. Um, they were in their longhouse celebrating the green corn dance, which was their annual Thanksgiving. The uh, Massachusetts Bay governor called out the militia and the mercenaries. Uh, anytime Indian people got together and start talking, they figured they were plotting against them. That's how paranoid they were. And they obviously overreacted. They attacked the longhouse and uh, they set it afire. Those that didn't burn to death, man, woman, and child, 800 and some were slaughtered. The, Governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, to give thanks over their victory over the savages, pagans, what they called them. Um, I guess people that wouldn't submit to Christianity and uh, uh, 
he gave thanks and they celebrated their first Thanksgiving. That's where Thanksgiving really had its origins. Uh, reference is uh, a doctor, Charles Newell, I believe. I don't know his last name is Newell. Uh, he was an uh, uh, anthropology, archaeology professor at uh, one of the Eastern colleges. And he himself was a Penobscot Indian. And he did research on the massacre of the Pequots. And, um, and because of the massacre and other massacres against them, and the fact that their men were all mariners, sailors, fishermen, many of them lost their lives at sea, over a period of time, Africans escaping from slavery were taken in by the Pequots. And so here you have a case where the Pequot nation were able to retrace their roots and their continuous form of government and social structures where they were able to get federal recognition and eventually opened one of the largest uh, casino resort operations uh, up in uh, Ledyard, I think Massachusetts, up in that area near Hartford. Uh, very successful. And when the word got out, uh, a lot of people across the country wanted to get enrolled up there. It was for this. And I remember one of the leaders of the uh, Pequot Nation currently one time told me, he said uh, we had to set up an enrollment office and an enrollment committee to screen those that could prove their roots, could prove their connection with the Pequots were enrolled and others would be rejected. And they tell this story, which I find quite humorous. He said they got a call one time from somebody in Mississippi and they could tell by the accent that the man was African American. And he said, he was telling him, he says, you know, I just found out that I'm one of you peacocks. And you know, heard the word Pequot, Pequot. So that type of thing happened. Sure, definitely. Uh, people want to get their shirt tail relation, even though they're not eligible to be enrolled, to get them enrolled. Because some of these tribes are paying some pretty large dividends. I mean, large. What about $52,000 a month dividend? That's some kind of stock there, isn't it? So, you know, obviously it brings out the greed in people. They, uh, some of them don't want to share this with others, so they will not enroll people that are eligible to be enrolled and they'll enroll their shirt-tail relation and relatives uh, so that they can get this money when the real Indian doesn't get it. And I think that's really a sad commentary. So you have a situation where some people may be getting $50,000 a month, other people in other nations are... Nothing. Nothing. And, and so at left. Pine Ridge, Pine Ridge is a place with no Very casino. isolated. Uh, so what is the income? I think they got 40,000 members, if my memory serves me right. And they how have many a very you... isolated uh, casino in a, in a, a very uh, uh, rural area. They can't generate the kind of population, money through a large population. So they're not doing that well. So obviously it'd be impossible for them to pay a dividend to 40,000 tribal members. What would they give them, a dollar a month? I mean, it doesn't make sense. In that case, it makes more sense to take whatever revenues that benefits the whole nation as a whole. You know, buying land back or some form of housing or employment or scholarship monies, and I think that's what tribes are doing. My own tribe from the White Earth Ojibwe Nation, 26,000 members. We have a uh, uh, the Shooting Star Casino, uh, right on the reservation, midway between Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, Fargo, North Dakota, Grand Forks, North Dakota. So we have a population we can draw on, but not anywhere near the Mashantucket Pequots who can draw on New York, or the Shakopee, Milwaukee, Dakota who can draw on the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. So. Um, you know, unfortunately, not everybody benefits by it, but overall, um, I can't say anything bad against casino resorts because it's bringing in the infusion of capital that is badly needed by most of our tribe. I just wish that some of the more wealthier tribes could find a way to 
develop uh, scholarship services that would benefit every Indian child that wants an education. I mean, what would be wrong with that? You know, there was a time that Indian people in a communal way of life used to share. Like I told you when I was a kid, we'd go out and get a lot of fish, we'd have some for our family, we'd see that everybody had fish in the community. I wish that some of our current leadership could learn that lesson. I think it would be a lot better. Well, so taking taking that thought and going back to what you had <coughs> commented about the um, the Allotment Act, the Dawes uh -huh. Allotment Act, was that it? Yeah. So prior, am I right in my understanding that the Allotment Act was forced on the various nations? Definitely. And that prior, that the whole purpose was to break up what had been tribal land. Or so, can you talk a little bit about perhaps? The, then the way land, the, the role it would have played prior to this when it sure. was community owned and this yeah. was then was just another attempt to break up those communities. Exactly. I mean, you know, there was a tribal communal concept or ownership of property. Uh, a lot of our great leaders of the past always said that you can't own the land. You know, what are you going to do? Carve up the clouds? Carve up the air? Uh, how can you own Mother Earth, and that was their, uh, the concept of that. It was there to provide for its inhabitants. We didn't have this concept of ownership, rather a communal ownership of uh, territory. Uh, of course, the government was always, from immediately after the treaties were signed, were already scheming to get the timber and get the gas, the oil, the gold, the minerals, the iron ore which has been looted out of our lands up in northern Minnesota um, and other communities across the country. So they schemed and they finally came up with this uh, General Allotment Act. And there was somebody who said, we got to get them saying I instead of we. Get them used to the concept of I own this, I own that, rather than we own it. We have it together. So. That was actually a conspiracy to do that, to break up the communal ownership of property and to allot lands to Indian people. Then they passed laws that said if you were less than full blood, you could uh, take your land in fee. But they didn't tell you it. then it also became subject to taxation. That was part of the whole scheme. So in my case, um, 750 of our grandfathers and grandmothers <clears throat> turned into 7 8 degree Indian overnight. Now, how'd they do that? They brought some anthropologists in to scratch their skin and get some blood. And then they would analyze that and they'd say, well, this, this person here is less than full blood. It was all a conspiracy. It was a fraud. And so what they did is they declared 750 full blood grandfathers and grandmothers on the White Earth Ojibwe and other reservations in northern Minnesota to be less than full blood. Then they gave them a fee patent, right? They could get a fee for the fee patent for their land, and then it became subject to taxation and or they could sell it. Well, then the, the land sharks came in, the big timber companies came in. And uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, one of the biggest corporations in the world, all of their wealth comes from stealing from us. Warehousers, Steenersons, I could go on and on. The big iron ore companies, U.S. Steel, the John Jacob Astor fortune, that was all stolen from our people. So that's what they did. So they forced uh, allotments on our people, then systematically looted them from the allotments. And where they, the people would not sell, give up their land, or if they would pay their taxes, which legally they should not have had to pay, uh, the state, the counties would take it for back taxes. Then they would turn around and sell this to the, the settlers, the immigrants coming in. And that's how they broke up a lot of our reservation, uh, in the integrity, the uh, contiguous uh, uh, land base that was owned by all the people communally and not individually. So I've heard it said that 
back in 1900, there were a lot of uh, a lot of the white leadership, the government people, whatever judges, really believed that the native nations would be extinct in a hundred years. That there just simply would, whether it was through assimilation or extermination, there just wouldn't be any more Indians. So now, instead, what we have is a situation where, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got the first generations of Native people who have law degrees, PhDs in various specialties. We've got a birth rate that is increasing the population, and there's at least for the moment an economic input from casinos that it's almost like that money slipped by they couldn't fi couldn't find a way of sidetracking that because as the trust fund shows the other money has always been there yeah it's been just simply stolen mm -hmm. so maybe this is a hopeful mix of of ingredients for the future eh? well again uh if you will recall the words of uh, Virgil Killstreet which incidentally for your for our viewers and uh, listeners out there on AIM, Internet, Television, and Radio, um, they can find these words on the homepage of our website. The piece is called, What is the American Indian Movement? And uh, the fact that the American Indian Movement was said to be first a, uh, from the inside, many of us are cleansing themselves. Uh, many have returned to the old traditional spiritual ceremonies, teachings, way of life, values of their tribes, away from the confused notions of a society that has made them slaves of their own unguided lives. And it said that the American Indian Movement is first a spiritual movement, a religious rebirth, and then the rebirth of dignity and pride in a people. Uh, those words are very important because what the American Indian movement was sparked, literally, a rebirth of uh, an understanding of our tree of life. Our tree of life at the turn of the century almost withered and died because those outside factions, entities, were attacking the spiritual, cultural, social, economic, political, and philosophical roots of our tree of life. They were almost successful in destroying this tree. But it is said that at Wounded Knee in 1890 and again in 1973 that the blood of our martyrs nurtured the roots of our tree of life, which is now this tree is powerful. It's like a mighty oak tree with those roots that I described, spiritual, cultural, social, economic, political, philosophical roots come deep from within the bosom of Mother Earth. The tree is, is powerfully rooted in Mother Earth, and everything flows into the, our nation, our tree of life in that way. So what happened in sparking this new consciousness, many of our people started to persevere in high school, struggle to get through, graduate, go to a two-year degree program, get some training in one of our American Indian Employment Job Training Centers, which we are developing a network, a premier program right here in Minneapolis where we've taken uh, more than 30,000 mostly Indian women and men off of welfare rolls, out of poverty, away from despair, frustration, broken homes, battered families, shattered dreams, and gave them hope for the future. That's what this movement stands for. Hope gives them hope. And many of these people now have gotten training where they can take care of their families, have gone on to higher education, gotten degrees. We've got more PhDs and doctors today than you can imagine. We've got more people in uh, university campuses across the country in almost every area, science, medicine, uh, we even had one Indian man of the Chickasha Nation went out into outer space. And a lot of these people will give credit to the fact that the movement sparked this rebirth. So yes, uh, we're hopeful. Uh, we're much more optimistic today. 
than we were, say, even 30 years ago when this movement started. I don't believe that even we, and I wasn't one of the original founders. I didn't get involved till late 69. This movement started in Minneapolis in 1968. Um, but looking back uh, and looking to see what has happened today, uh, I'm quite enthusiastic and uh, very optimistic uh, for the future. Um, tribes are diversifying, taking their monies, they're putting it into other forms of development. Many tribes now have buffalo herds, they're bringing back the buffalo. As the buffalo comes back, we become stronger. Um, we're uh, seeing tribes developing their own agricultural projects again, growing food, uh, cattle herds. Uh, that gives us hope for the future. Um, and because of the spiritual rebirth that we sparked, we even see that the eagle has come back. And the eagle is a very sacred uh, uh, spirit, a very special creature of the Gichimani Du, the Great Spirit. The eagle is uh, is a symbol of our, our of our spirituality. That's why the eagle claw, the eagle feather, used in our dress and our beautiful regalia, uh, uh, because of the sacredness of the eagle, which incidentally. Uh, it really irks me when I see the United States who stole our eagle uh, as a symbol of American imperialism. Uh, they've really uh, desecrated the sacred eagle. <clears throat> and while a vulture <clears throat> and while a vulture or a buzzard also serves a good constructive role in life. Uh, I would think that the United States, uh, by virtue of its character, uh, should have adopted the buzzard or the vulture as its symbol rather than the sacred eagle. Well, then one last question maybe about the, uh, about sort of the current state of politics. And that is just, so then with the 580 tribes, there are 580 tribal governments, right? For the most part. For the most part. <laughs> So is there, an, is there an issue then with some of those governments ho wanting to hold more to traditional values and others of them being less concerned with that? Or, or I guess, w to what extent is there a, f a unity of spirit between these many, obviously we're talking about many, many different people here with different situations, and is that a big issue or is that not such a... Well, first of all, uh, you generally have your elected leadership in an imposed so-called democ democratic process of government. Um, then you have your traditional leadership, your traditional structure, uh, headsmen and headswomen, or clan mothers and, and uh, traditional spiritual leaders. In some cases, they're both. These people have been elected into office. So some function both as the more contemporary imposed form of government, but incorporate their traditional ceremonies and values into it. But for the most part, they're separate. Uh, some tribes will consult with the traditional leadership, but our traditional leadership was deposed under the Indian Reorganization Act, and they established a so-called model of democracy after the U.S form of supposed democracy. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, that's how, you know, the tribal governments operate today. Uh, some distinctly separate from the traditional structure. Some they have the traditional leaders incorporated into the elected system. So there's a little bit of both. You've been listening to a selection from the AIM archive. 